Sherlock Holmes is a schoolboy in an adult world. Brilliant deduction, Watson. A world of hidden dangers. I'm afraid this is only the tip of the iceberg. And unknown threats. What have I got myself into? The adventure of a lifetime, Watson. Paul. Young Sherlock Holmes, next Sunday at 7.15 on BBC One. In 15 minutes, every man joins a Tibetan monk as he searches for the reincarnation of his dead spiritual master. First, the news with Michael Burke. The Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, warned his people tonight not to gamble on violence. The future is going to be painful, he said, we, but we mustn't go the way of Yugoslavia. The ceasefire in Georgia breaks down, the president's holding out in a basement, and British doctors claim a breakthrough in the treatment of AIDS. Good evening. The Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, went on nationwide television tonight to call on his people not to resort to violence. He said the transition to a market economy that's due to start on Thursday would be most painful and unpopular because it would lead to big price rises. It's a forced measure, but there's no other way out, he said. He acknowledged that tension was rising in many parts of Russia, but he urged people not to gamble on violence and start a new civil war. Boris Yeltsin was giving awards in Moscow today and also giving a promise to his people that life will get better by the second half of next year if his strategy for radical economic reform works. On television tonight, Mr Yeltsin said that when price controls are lifted this Thursday, it will be painful, but he appealed for patience. Of course, everyone's nerves are on edge. There's a weariness from the trials of everyday life. But there's a deep understanding that we must not, under any circumstances, gamble on violence. Mr Yeltsin said that one step his government is taking is to cut off virtually all aid to foreign countries, an expensive legacy from the old Soviet Union. At home, he's trying to reassure the rest of the new Commonwealth that Russia does not want to dominate. He met the Armenian leader today and signed a cooperation treaty. But behind the smiles, members of the Commonwealth are finding it hard to agree what to do with the military power they've inherited. Most states want a combined Commonwealth defense force, but some want their own individual armies. And even Russia is pressing ahead with its own National Guard. Russia also wants to have a national guard. Russia wants to have a National Guard of between 30 and 40,000 men. All the documents for it are just about ready. In the Belarusian city of Minsk tomorrow, Commonwealth leaders will try to resolve their differences. Troops serving there have mixed views about what should happen to the old Soviet army now. We want all the nationalities of all the states to serve together, said this soldier. His friend agrees there should be one Commonwealth, one defense force. No, said this soldier, each republic should have its own army. The arguments at tomorrow's summit meeting are likely to be intense, but the decisions made there will be critical. The whole military future of the new Commonwealth is being discussed, at a time when differences between individual member states are widening with every day that passes. Ben Brown, BBC News, Moscow. Boris Yeltsin's decision to cut foreign aid will hit the economies of several countries. Soviet aid has been decreasing in recent years, particularly to the Third World. But Cuba and Vietnam still receive around £2 billion a year each. And Afghanistan, Angola and Mozambique also get help. The end of financial subsidies from Moscow will be felt hardest in Cuba. 33 years after Fidel Castro seized power, the Western Hemisphere's only communist regime faces its gravest crisis. Over three quarters of Cuba's trade was with the old Soviet Union. It was all subsidized, the Cubans importing underpriced oil and manufactured goods and exporting overpriced sugar, fruit and nickel. If Cuba now has to pay the market price for imported oil, an already tight system of rationing will be intensified. Already, Cubans queue for most foodstuffs and consumer goods. Now the government may have to introduce soup kitchens, electricity rationing and cut petrol for private use. 
The only alternative might be for the aging Cuban dictator to introduce democratic reforms. But Castro knows elections might end his rule and vows to keep his one-party state. But the end of Russian aid could destroy the patience of Cuba's people. In Afghanistan, the Mujahideen have gained ground since Soviet troops pulled out nearly three years ago. But President Najibullah's regime, which they'd been fighting for, continues to receive economic aid, mostly food and fuel. However, some of this comes from the Central Asian republics of the former Soviet Union, who see the Mujahideen as a threat and may keep some supplies flowing. But Boris Yeltsin's decision to cut Russian aid could spell doom for the regimes in Kabul as well as the Cuban capital, Havana. The ceasefire in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia has broken down, and rebel forces say they're stepping up their efforts to get rid of President Gamsakhurdia. He's been holding out under gunfire in the basement of the parliament building in Tbilisi, even though some of his supporters are now backing demands for him to go. The Tbilisi Hotel, formerly the opposition headquarters, continued to burn out of control today. No fire engines were able to get through the sniper fire. The troops, forced to abandon it last night, have pulled back to a historical institute containing the Lenin Museum. Today they were regrouping and being issued with fresh weapons, having effectively lost ground to the fighters still loyal to President Gamsakhurdia. The opposition leader, Tengiz Kitovani, said one of their number was killed within an hour of the declared ceasefire, a ceasefire which appeared to collapse during the afternoon. Both sides were involved in fierce exchanges of fire. Last night, talks aimed at a peaceful settlement collapsed when none of Mr. Gamsakhurdia's representatives turned up. The opposition are demanding his resignation. So is the leader of the National Guardsmen, who were loyal to the president until last night. The loss of his support is a considerable setback to Mr. Gamsakhurdia. He has up to 400 men under his command. Cover. The parliament building where the president is holding out is not completely encircled. His men still control the streets on the hillside above it. Though the buildings all around are destroyed and smouldering, the parliament itself is almost unscathed. President Gamsakhurdia's bunker is deep below it. Inside the parliament today, Mr Gamsakhurdia's supporters insisted there was no question of him giving in to what they called an attempted coup. There is no doubt that he has lost both political and military support, but he still has several hundred well-armed troops, and the building itself, though superficially damaged, has withstood all the opposition has fired at it so far. Surrounded by a large group of heavily armed bodyguards, Mr. Gamsakhurdia himself, looking grey and somewhat shaken, was apparently too busy even to say whether he would fight on. The power struggle here has wrecked much of the heart of the city. A peaceful solution appears to be as remote as ever. Carol Walker, BBC News, Tbilisi. Here, the Prime Minister will tell voters in his New Year message that Britain is now seeing the first signs of economic recovery. He'll try to revive public confidence in the economy, putting the emphasis on the reduction in inflation and interest rates despite a world recession. But Labour has accused Mr Major and the Chancellor of totally misjudging the depth of the recession. This, said Labour, was the launch of its election campaign, delivering a letter from Neil Kinnock to one million homes in Tory-held marginal seats. Accusing the government of destroying economic confidence, the letter seeks to convince voters that Labour is better suited to run the economy than the Tories. Dr Jack Cunningham, Labour's campaigns coordinator, told voters in York that the Tories were set to be punished. They've run out of ideas and they've run out of excuses and sooner or later he's going to run out of time, so he can't go on running forever. <laughs> With one economic survey due tomorrow showing that an average of 130 firms collapsed every day in 1991 and suggesting that the trend might get worse in the coming months, ministers are keen to set the recession in a worldwide context while finding some hopeful signs of recovery at home. It is happening and it will gather pace over the next few months and they will see that we have succeeded in bringing down inflation and the economy is set, well set, I believe, for several years, many years, I would hope, of low inflationary sustained growth uh, and we'll be up there among the best of our European competitors as we were during the 1980s. The game is increasingly looking like itself. I don't think there are many levers left that the Chancellor or the Prime Minister can pull to get the Tory party out of the hole and the economy out of its recession. The state of the economy will feature prominently in the forthcoming New Year messages from all the party leaders. Neil Kinnocks will reaffirm Labour's opposition to further tax cuts in favour of better public services. The Tories say that both are possible. 
And John Major's claim that we're now seeing the first signs of economic recovery will be seized upon by some rather nervous Tory backbenchers, all wishing that those signs so close to an election were much more visible. British doctors have discovered a drug treatment which they hope could delay the onset of AIDS in patients who are HIV positive. Initial results from a trial suggest that combining the drug acyclovir, which is widely used to combat certain viral infections, with the anti-AIDS drug AZT can slow the development of the full symptoms of AIDS. The Royal Free Hospital is one of London's main centres for the treatment of AIDS. Today, doctors at the hospital are claiming success for a new kind of combination drug therapy. Professor Paul Griffiths and colleagues from the Westminster Hospital, together with doctors from Germany and Australia, enrolled 300 patients into a trial of the drug.